Welcome to Presence, a global conversation for a new earth with hosts Doug King and Cody Deese. Thank you and welcome everybody. I am Doug and I am here with Cody and Doug. Yeah. We're starting a whole new concept today. Yes, we are. I'm excited about it. Yeah. I uh, First of all, the eschatology, the 10 parts, um, man, there's still so much more to say about it, but yet uh, just such a refreshing reframing and insight into what eschatology is and the crux of it in light of what we're talking about. And so uh, over the course of the next uh, a few episodes, we want to talk about the body of Christ. Yeah, because that's really now the implications of what we talked about for 10 episodes, the so what. And we can we can say, OK, uh, instead of uh, there's a coming of Christ in the future, that's something that applied to past history. The next question is, so what? Where does what does that mean? What are its ramifications? And they're substantial and they're very radical And the things we're about to present, Cody, in this whole series, as you well know, on the body of Christ, is going to, again, be a radical reframing of a 2,000-year-old message that is showing that there are some difficulties today. Yeah. uh, One of the things that we talked about in the eschatology series is that the role and function of the body of Christ is complete. Yes. That's a foreign idea to good percentage of the world. (laughs) Yes, especially those who are in or are purporting to be in that body. Yes. And so what we're continuing to do from the spiral is to say that we want to transcend anything that is limiting the work of God in Jesus. Anything that limits the work of God in Jesus, we want to see that transcended because that is a boundary-driven way of seeing God and what we want to do is include, and so not just transcend, so by including, we are not abandoning the biblical narrative, we are reinterpreting it, we are including it, and we are re-examining it so we can question, okay, after 2,000 years of history, where do we stand today, how's this working, and can God be bigger than this? Yeah, so to bring our listeners up to speed of kind of framing where we're headed here. Again, developmental chart spiral dynamics. Um, We have been in this transformation process. So you think about post-modernity being the leading edge, integral being where we are headed, what we are discussing. There is an evolutionary leap from first tier to second tier. Uh, Again, uh, the Venn diagram, form, transform, uh, where the two circles connect and then formless. And so we're still in this stage of transform. We're also bringing in Wilbur's uh, four quadrants, which are really important because that's helping us kind of chart a little bit about what we talk about when we talk about the individual Jesus and then the body of Christ. So these four quadrants, you have uh, the individual and the collective. So the individual being Jesus, upper left, Um, And then you have the body of Christ, which would be the collective. You have the internal and external. Um, So those are the developmental charts that we're using. And you can find those in the show notes and it'd be really helpful for you visually as we talk about um, this transformation process. So that said, Doug, I want to talk about the body of Christ over the next couple episodes. And a big question for me is if the role and function of the body of Christ is complete, well, then what is the future of faith communities? Yeah. And beyond that, like you think about the language people talk about, uh, the church. Yes. And they use that as language to separate themselves and or someone else from someone else. Yeah. So it's, oh, well, we are the church. Right. They aren't. Right. We are. So what are we saying? We're the body of Christ. Yes. They are not. Correct. Um, so we need to talk about its role and function, which it had, yes. but then how that role and function is complete, and then what that means for us. This is what you just said, the so what for today, correct? and how does that translate uh, for us in 2018? Absolutely. And uh, again, when you say or use the term the church, if we actually examine that term, 
there's no such thing. There's only thousands of iterations called denominations all saying they're the church, the body of Christ, but they all go to different buildings in different places on Sunday. And that kind of leads us into the main text that I think you wanted to start with. And that's a question Paul asked 2000 years ago. Yeah. Oh, man, guys. Go ahead. If you're if you're driving down the road, you want to make sure, first of all, your seatbelts are already fastened, <laughs> but you're going to definitely want to make sure it's connected right now. Um, okay, so here's, I guess maybe the, the big question is this. Let's just start here. We talk about the body of Christ. Uh, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? Divided. Okay, so there's a particular text. So we'll just get all sermony if you want to. Yeah, uh, let's, let's just jump it. into well, like a sermon. Sometimes, like in past episodes and, and episodes I did with Danae, before we read from the biblical narrative, uh, we will often give a Bible warning to people who may be gun shy. Um, depending upon uh, what their particular church experience has been, but but yeah, we we are we are again not abandoning the narrative. Rather, we are reinterpreting uh, so that we can transcend to a higher view of God. My God, people, I want just listen to this text. All right, uh, I want to read. This is First Corinthians chapter three. Yeah. So this is where we'll kick off. All right, uh, brothers and sisters. I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. (laughs) Yes. He's only getting warmed up. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And then, Doug, (laughs) this one, listen to this one. Indeed, you are still not ready. (laughs) Right. Right. Ah. Yes. Well, he's, he's talking. Paul, he's come talking. On. He got a real problem in Corinth. God. And and the problem is what we have talked about, Cody, in this entire series, and that's the importance of developmental maps and resources. Paul is saying that spiritual consciousness is a developmental situation, just like we've used the example in the past. Childhood is developmental, developmental psychology, going to school through the grades. And now you have Paul saying that you have been brought in on milk. Well, that's the way you raise the baby. But you're not ready to go on to solid food. If I give you something integral to think about, you're going to choke on it. I mean, that's basically what he's saying. You're you're not ready to go to the next. He wasn't dissing the fact that this is all a journey. And look, this is a journey for me, too. Neither you nor I are claiming we've arrived anywhere. God, it's just the opposite, right? I hope not. (laughs) No, no. What we're saying, though, is that human consciousness has been evolving since there's been the breath of life uh, put into us. And that Paul is seeing 2000 years ago that something troubling was happening that was leading to some real problems, and it was a consciousness issue. They weren't maturing into higher consciousness modes. That's spiral dynamics. Mm, it's like so much of what Paul is saying, and to me, this was the this this is what opened my eyes, uh, even in my own process of evolution, to the beauty of the biblical narrative. Is that it is uh, a record of evolving human consciousness. Yeah. And when you see that for the first time, the text to me came alive into all new ways. Yeah. Just like Paul is just saying, yep, uh, we all know this. You're still not ready for it because here's the thing. What do we love to do at our stages of consciousness? Hold on to it. Grab hold of it because it's comfortable. It's familiar. It's what we know. And this is why all the great theorists talk about you look forward with fear. Right. And you generally look back with disdain. Mm. But if we're not careful, uh, we tend to get to a place where maybe we feel like, oh, we probably never say this, but I'm pretty comfortable at the stage of consciousness that I'm at. So in some ways, I think I've kind of learned all it is that I need to learn. Yeah. You know, and going back to the spiral, when I was in the traditional blue meme phase, it was even more than that for me, Cody. I 
I thought I really did have, quote, the truth. Mm -hmm. And my job wasn't growth. My job was defending. I was to defend the truth. There was no more growth involved. Someone says, you need to, there's more to the truth. That would have freaked me out. I would have been like, wait a minute, wait a minute. My job is to know all the truth and then to cling to it, hold to it and defend it, put boundaries around it and defend those boundaries against all those who are outside those boundaries. So this is Paul again, reminding us, no, this is a growing up experience from milk to the solid food and they weren't ready for it. And that's because Corinth had a specific problem. And it actually, when he very, when he very first opens the letter, in the first chapter, he said he's very troubled. And why was he very troubled? It was because some were saying, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Peter, mm-hmm. or I am of Christ. And Paul was troubled by that, Cody. because And so, so he's writing this letter to Corinth because something's going on that is going to be problematic in their faith experience of God, God identity, and what God was doing in Christ. And it has to do with being of, and then he names all these uh, characters in the story. When you're of something, that is a term that to me smacks of attachment. Mm. You are of uh, Apollos. Okay, you're attached to Apollos as if Apollos is a separate uh, thing, uh, or of Peter, or of me, or of Christ. And so this of, attachment, etc., that's bringing us back to the conversations that we had in the past about form. Doug, good Lord. Okay, a couple, just a couple thoughts while yeah. you were saying that. Yeah. Yeah, so Paul, essentially in this passage, um, he is addressing, because there's like these arguments going on. And essentially the argument is, well, my favorite teacher is Apollos. And I think Apollos has it nailed. Yes. And then some are just like, no, 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 no. Uh, Paul, Paul's the one, like he's the guy, which by the way, has no relevance for 2018. (laughs) Right. No. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Okay. We got over that. But you even had deeper insight on this. What I was like, God, uh, when you talk about even the people that they're naming and the division between Jew and Gentile. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about that in the context of even these people that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3? Yeah, absolutely. Because again, this is a real world situation. The Corinthians were real people living in a real time of history with these issues. Well, here's Paul, and we know that his ministry was to the Gentiles. So he was the first one in to teach the people at Corinth. He was the, quote, original guy. He was the founder of the Corinthian group. And so you have some that are saying, as Gentile believers, yeah, we're all about Paul. And then you have some that are saying, we are of Apollos. Well, Apollos came after Paul, and Apollos worked in Corinth. He also worked in Ephesus, and he was someone who came later. And there were those that were beginning to attach to Apollos. Then you have those in every city who were part of the Jewish following of Jesus, who were being brought into this Jew-Gentile situation, very shaky situation. And so you did have that minority of them who were saying, I am of Peter, because we have to remember that Peter and James and John were working in the Jerusalem church with the people of Israel, which means the Jewish followers of Jesus. And so now you have some that are following Peter, And those are people that are still keeping certain practices like circumcision as a part of their God identity, whereas Paul is teaching in Corinth and Galatia and Colossae that that had no application to the Gentile believers. And then you have Paul who comes along after, or Apollos who comes after Paul. And so what's happening there is that people are attaching to a person which another way we we would say this, Cody, would be they're attaching to uh, a, a particular biological form because it, mm. when you start saying Paul 
those are those are labels, Paul, Apollos, Peter. Those are labels for biological form. And so what they're doing is they're attaching to a form, a form of teaching, a form of principles that relate to the person uh, of that particular biological form. Okay. As you're saying that, a couple of things are coming to mind. One, um, and there's so many levels to this attachment to biological form, but I remember, uh, and this has happened a few times, particularly even uh, when I was uh, deconstructing so much of what I was handed as a child, uh, probably in modernity and even moving into post-modernity or at least having states of that, um, one of the things that people were so frustrated about with me is, Doug, I would get questions like this. Well, uh, whose camp are you in? Right. Um, yeah. Or they would say things like, okay, so what church do you belong to? Sure. Like where, because because the thing I've learned about the ego is it loves categories in labels. Yeah. Because we can move it in our brain and say, oh, well, that's who they are. Yes. And one of the things that was so frustrating when I used to travel and speak is I didn't really have necessarily a base camp per se. Um, and, and so no one could ever like pin it down. And there was something real refreshing to me about that. And I also kind of see it in Jesus. Not that, I'm, dear God, I'm not comparing myself to Jesus, but I, I do see that in Jesus, where it was like they could never get the guy. They're like, we got to figure out who this guy is and where he's from and who his group is and who his people are. And then even when I went to seminary, seminary, it was like, well, you tell me, who are you attached to? Are you a Calvinist? Yes. Or are you an Arminianist? Yes. Um, you could go on and on. Now, let me take it up a whole new level. Are you a Baptist mm. or are you a Presbyterian? Are you Catholic or are you Protestant? Yes. Do you see the ways in which we divide and label? Doug, come on. I'm getting yeah. fired up. Can we take it up a whole nother level? Are you a Christian or yeah. are you a Muslim? Ah, uh, you've gone to meddling. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, you were doing so well there right till yep. the end, Cody. I know. So the whole principle behind division is what is going to manifest walls of hostility, as Paul calls it, when he wrote the same message to the Ephesian people. This, these walls of hostility, and it's always these boundaries that we use to establish and maintain some type of identity, which the ego must have a form to which to attach. When you take the ego into the realm of spirit, which means formlessness, it has eyes but cannot see and ears but cannot hear. Mm -hmm. So your point is that, first of all, there are Deno thousands of denominations. And, and typically speaking, just a kind of a sidebar that I, I thought about when you were saying this, in days past, uh, when I was meeting people on an airplane or at, at some place in a public place and, and you began a conversation with them, yeah, I'm from this city. Yeah, I'm heading up here. I'm going to the same city for this, this or this. Oh, really? And somebody uses a magic word like, yeah, you know, you have a blessed day. And they say, blessed day. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. You have, are you a uh, person of faith? Are you a Christian? You kind of find your way into, yeah, you're a Christian. Well, that's okay. But then the next thing for me always was, well, uh, where do you go to church? Because what I want to know is, what denomination do you go to? Because, <laughs> buddy, if you're from this, this, or this denomination, I'm going to start steering clear. Mm. And and this is and this is of course why there's so many denominations because of these form attachments into the attempt that people are making to do what the Corinthians were doing what the Corinthians were doing so so yeah the big thing here that we want to talk about with regard to Christian is that Paul could have said now look some of you are saying I am of Paul. Some of you are saying, I am of Apollos, and I am of Peter. But what you guys should be saying instead is, I am of Christ. But mm. Paul didn't say that. Paul said, here's a problem. You're saying, I am of Paul, Apollos, Peter, and you're saying, I am of Christ. He put Christ in the same problematic paradigm 
as the others, because what they were doing is they were misinterpreting Jesus or the Christ as a form rather than transform. Pause. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When the man knows his own statement's a grenade. Um, I had to repeat that. They were making Jesus just like Paul yes. and Apollos. They were making Jesus a form rather than seeing Jesus as transform. Man. So what a thousand questions come to my mind. Sure. Are we still doing that today? Yeah. What do we think Paul would say today if he just arrived, we picked him up at the Galactic Airport, and he said, so, hey, everybody, tell me what's going on. Uh, first of all, we would start by saying, well, let us tell you about Christianity, at which point he'd be like, what now? Well, let us tell you about the church. He'd be like, wait a minute. The church got caught up 2,000 years ago. I, I wrote to the Thessalonians, did you guys not read that, where I told them this whole thing of the body of Christ was a role and function that was going to be caught up, that it was... Com- what do you mean, the church? Well, actually, Paul, there is no such thing as the church. Basically, there's thousands and thousands of denominations that say they're the church or the body of Christ. And then Paul would say, in my opinion, did you not read the part where I ask the question, is Christ divided? If you ask anyone on the street today, Christian or non-Christian, do you think that there's divisions within Christianity? People would look at you like, what, what do you mean? I mean, it's, it's, it's made up of denominations. That's, that's identity to a person. What is your identity? I am a, you fill in the name of the denomination. And even if you say you're non-denominational, what you're saying is I'm a non-denominational Christian and you are not, meaning that you're something else. your, Your identity is different. You're not part of an all nations promise to Abraham that is found fulfilled in all nations walking in God's light, meaning in that identity of God. Rather, you are, through something you do, different than other people, and by the thing that you do, the place that you go, and the teaching to which you've attached, you have established your identity. And this is what Paul was concerned about 2,000 years ago because he knew that at that time in history, the natural tendency was to do that, that that's what the self does. It attempts to attach to forms. Yeah, I was thinking about my own personal experience of pastoring a church Mm -hmm. and and, uh, growing up as like a pastor's kid and uh, seeing so much uh, splitting and dividing on every little nuanced word. Yes. So it's like I could do a series of teachings on love, Mm -hmm. and six months later, no one would still agree on what love is. Right. Uh, And it's like all of this division and detachment and hair splitting down to the, the, the... the nuanced theological idea of anything, yes. no one can seem to agree on any of that. Right. And what happens is we've attached ourselves to all of these forms to try to find some sense of self-identity. I've said this, and this is what's so important about this thought, is when you talk about uh, they're making Jesus a form rather than seeing Jesus transform, that isn't that is elevating Jesus. Yes. As opposed to uh, devaluing or demoting him, this is actually elevating Jesus into the place that I think, as you read the narrative, Jesus was intended to be and preached and taught from the beginning. Yes. Uh, I've often said this, but, uh, and this isn't like a, like a cute cliche, I found this to be true. 
that if you want to build a large, like mega church, well, then just tell people to worship Jesus. But if you want to shrink one, then tell people to follow Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Because and I don't think I've said that before on this podcast, but the, the reality is, is uh, there's a dis, there's a clear distinction between the two. And what you find in that worship of Jesus is this attachment to yet another form, as opposed to following this Christ, which our, the, the irony behind all of this is never in the narrative of Jesus, they worship me, period. But he continually is like, follow me, take up your cross, follow me. This is a path. This is a way of wisdom. I'm trying to lead you, show you something to see. And maybe like what we've done for thousands of years now is attach yet to another form. Absolutely. Absolutely. Attached to another form. And that form is not a new concept, Cody. This is this is why Jesus is transform. Transform means that the role and function of Christ was to take humanity beyond form. Well, what was the form that they were to go beyond? The form that they were to go beyond was the religion of a temple, a geographical place where God is worshipped, to go beyond priesthoods and priests and pastors and rabbis and uh, scribes and Pharisees, and geography of land, and city walls, and ethnicities, and genders, and everything that was a boundary describing a form that by which one is then judged, and judgment was is huge in the world of form. You can only have judgment in the world of form, for you must have two forms in order to judge one versus the other. And so this transform meant that Jesus was not coming to bring another form, and that means that his body, as a mirror reflection of the head, also could not be a his, a form to be taken through history. You see, when you take, when if the church is not caught up, and its role and function of transform doesn't deliver us, deliver us into universal God identity, universal God identity, then you have a particularism called Christianity that's taken through history. That body of Christ is taken through history, and it becomes the new form, which is the very thing Jesus was against. And so for me, the body of Christ is an amazing thing, and I am, and I give thanks for the body of Christ. I've use the example, Cody, I think in one of the last few episodes of the eschatology, that that becomes the new Jerusalem. Mm. And I walk in the light of the body of Christ. And maybe next go around, we talk about body of Christ, we'll talk more about what that means. But certainly, when Paul asked the question, is Christ divided? He knew that the answer to that was no, because it's impossible for the body, for the true body of Christ to be divided. That would have been an impossibility. The only way you could divide the body of Christ is if you turn it into a form, and that means that you didn't understand the transformative work of Christ. And as Paul says here, uh, when you attach that form, uh, there is jealousy and arguing among you. Uh, but the reality is, is, I just think about two years ago, I wouldn't be ready for this conversation. No, um, no. And depending on where you are as a listener in this particular stage in which you are, uh, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just the reality of how the evolution of consciousness works is that for lots of people, this may be too much for them. Absolutely. And that's exactly what Paul addresses at the beginning of this letter. He says, uh, uh, you just like you weren't ready for it yet. Um, and he says, and you're still not um, and maybe that's the case for you as you're listening. So I'll just say, hang with us, uh, process, think about how you're attached, uh, and I attach to certain forms in particular, uh, biological forms and denominational forms, um, and religious forms. So Doug, uh, our time's up. We'll stop there for now. Um, in the next one, there's still so much more in this text, so maybe we'll jump back in it and uh, go from there. So for all of you that are listening, hope you have a fantastic week. Thank you for joining us today. 
If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at info at presence.tv. You can also visit our website at presence.tv or find us on Facebook. We look forward to hearing from you. 